On this episode of Bookshelf TV, we look at an ancient military text that will show you how to outmaneuver your opponent before they ever know what's happening. Military leaders have used it for centuries to defeat their enemies. It is, of course, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a Chinese general, military strategist, and a writer who lived in ancient China during the period 544 BC. He is revered in Chinese and East Asian culture as a legendary historical and military figure, but is best known in Western society for his book The Art of War. His overall philosophy focuses on finding an alternative to battle, making alliances, and using deceit instead of spilling blood during actual warfare. We've given the book an overall score of 7.5 out of 10. It's very concise, only 40 or so pages with many insightful lessons and has clearly been written by a master of their craft. So if you want to pick up the same copy that I'm holding here, then click on the Amazon links below where you can order it for yourself or check out the full in-depth book review on our website. Chapter one is all about creating intelligent plans. In order to be successful in any battle, you need to have thought about every conceivable outcome and put contingency plans in place for each one. The author explains the five factors that govern warfare and then provides some useful advice about how to behave in common battle scenarios. The five factors of warfare are the moral law, heaven, earth, the commander, and method and discipline. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Chapter two deals with the actual task of initiating battles in war. The main premise is that long drawn out wars are not beneficial for either side because they cost money and lives. The goal therefore should be to disarm your enemy so that you can achieve victory swiftly. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their ardour will be damped. In war then, let your great objective be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Supreme excellence in warfare comes through breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. The author provides the five essentials for victory in war, which are knowing when to fight and when not to fight knowing how to handle both superior and inferior forces, ensuring your army is animated with the same spirit throughout all its ranks, preparing yourself and waiting to take the enemy unprepared, and maintaining full authority without interference by any sovereign. He then goes on to explain the three ways a general can bring misfortune on his army. The first is by commanding the army to advance or retreat, but being ignorant of the fact that they cannot obey. Number two is by attempting to govern an army the same way that you would administer a kingdom. Number three is by employing officers of your army based on favoritism and not based on merit. To fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. This chapter talks about securing yourself against defeat before ever venturing into battle. If you can ensure you do not lose, then all you have to do is wait for the opportune moment to defeat your enemy. The key is to make no mistakes in your battle plans so that you are able to win with ease. If you are able to do this, you will essentially be conquering an enemy who is already defeated. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty of victory, for it means conquering an enemy who is already defeated. Thus it is that in war, the victorious strategist only seeks battle 
after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. Chapter 5 analyses the difference between direct tactics and indirect tactics. Although direct tactics are required for engaging in actual battles, it is the indirect tactics which will ultimately secure victory and can never be exhausted. Direct and indirect tactics lead naturally onto one another, much like the four major elements of the earth, and if harnessed properly, their combined force generates momentum and will join together to become unstoppable. Only ever enter into battles where you are most likely to win. In every situation, your enemy will have areas of strength and areas of weakness. It is up to the intelligent general to identify the weaknesses and find a way to expose them. You must always be aware of the individual circumstances of each situation, as the same weakness may not be exploited in the same way in two different scenarios. Do not repeat the circumstances which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. Military tactics are like unto water, for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downwards. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Maneuvering is the art of ensuring you are always in a position of strength in relation to your enemy. This chapter explains how intelligent maneuvering is one of the best ways to implement deception in warfare. However, in order to do so effectively, you must first have the obedience and discipline of your army. The author then explains a number of specific scenarios and how you should alter your position according to each one. The difficulty in tactical maneuvering consists in turning the devious into the direct and misfortune into gain. A soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning, by noonday it has begun to flag, and in the evening his mind is bent only on returning to camp. A clever general, therefore, avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return. Never rely on one form of attack or defense. Assess each situation individually and choose the best solution for each one. You must consider the advantages and disadvantages of every conceivable approach before ever taking action. The author stresses that you must take heed of these five dangerous faults which can undermine any general. They are recklessness, which leads to destruction, cowardice, which leads to capture, a hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults, too much honor, which is sensitive to shame, and over solicitude for your men, which exposes you to worry and trouble. In the wise leader's plans, considerations of advantage and of disadvantage will be blended together. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Chapter 9 discusses how to keep your soldiers healthy and ready for battle whilst on the move. It provides a number of insights into how to read an enemy's behaviour so that you can understand their intent. Many of the lessons in this chapter are relatable more broadly to human nature and are therefore applicable in the modern world as well as in ancient warfare. When the enemy is close at hand and remains quiet, he is relying on the natural strength of his position. When he keeps aloof and tries to provoke a battle, he is anxious for the other side to advance. Peace proposals unaccompanied by a sworn covenant indicate a plot. Soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity, but kept under control by means of iron discipline. This is a certain road to victory. If a general shows confidence in his men, but always insists on his orders being obeyed, the gain will be mutual. This chapter gives information on the six different types of terrain in battle and the merits of each one. The first is accessible ground, which is ground which can be freely traversed. Entangling ground is ground which can be abandoned but is hard to reoccupy. 
Temporizing ground is ground where neither side will gain from making the first move. Narrow passes should be occupied first and strongly garrisoned so that you can await the arrival of the enemy. And precipitous heights are areas where if you arrive before your enemy, you should occupy the sunny areas and then wait for them to come up and meet you. Positions at a great distance from the enemy when your forces are equal mean that you should not provoke a battle. This chapter describes the nine most common situations you are likely to find yourself in during warfare. The first is dispersive ground, which means when you're fighting in your own territory. Facile ground is when you penetrate into hostile territory, but to no great distance. Contentious ground is ground that would provide an advantage to either side. Open ground is ground where each side has liberty of movement. Ground of intersecting highways is ground which forms the key to three contiguous states, so that whoever occupies it first has most of the empire at their command. Serious ground is when an army has penetrated into the heart of a hostile country, leaving a number of fortified cities in its rear. Difficult ground is ground like mountain, forests, and rugged steeps that is very hard to traverse. Hemmed in ground is ground that is hard to reach and escape from, so you can be defeated by a smaller enemy. And desperate ground is ground where your only choice is to fight for survival. Confront your soldiers with the deed itself. Never let them know your design. When the outlook is bright, bring it before their eyes, but tell them nothing when the situation is gloomy. Place your army in deadly peril and it will survive. Plunge it into desperate straits and it will come off in safety. For it is precisely when a force has fallen into harm's way that it is capable of striking a blow for victory. There are five ways of attacking by fire. The first is to burn soldiers while they're in their camp. The second is burning stores. The third is burning baggage trains. The fourth is burning ammunition. And the fifth is hurling dropping fire into the middle of your enemy. However, when choosing to use fire in battle, you must be prepared for these five possible developments. Number one, when fire breaks out inside the enemy's camp, you need to respond at once with an attack. If there's an outbreak of fire but the enemy's soldiers remain quiet, bide your time and do not attack. When the flames reach their highest point, follow it up with an attack, but only if it seems practical. If not, just stay where you are. If it is not possible to make an assault with fire, don't wait for it to break out and therefore miss the opportunity to deliver your attack at a favorable moment. And when you start a fire, be on the windward side of it. Do not attack from the leeward side. Those who use fire as an aid to the attack show intelligence. Those who use water as an aid to the attack gain an accession of strength. The final chapter discusses the usefulness of spies in warfare and how best to utilize them. There are five different types of spies, which are local spies, which means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district, inward spies, this means making use of officials of the enemy, converted spies, getting hold of the enemy spies and using them for our own purposes, doomed spies, which is where your spy will do certain things openly for the purposes of deception, and surviving spies, spies who bring back news from the enemy's camp. What enables the wise sovereign and the good general to strike and conquer and achieve things beyond the reach of ordinary men is foreknowledge. Knowledge of the enemy's dispositions can only be obtained by other men. The end and aim of spying in all its five variants is knowledge of the enemy, and this knowledge can only be derived in the first instance from the converted spy. Hence, it is essential that the converted spy be treated with the utmost liberality. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you get notified whenever we release new videos. Also, feel free to leave a comment below with a specific request if there is a book you would like us to review next. And finally, if you want to get a copy of this book for yourself, then go ahead and click the Amazon link below or if you are interested in the full detailed book review, then that is available on our website, which you can find all the links for down below as well. And as always, thank you for watching and I will see you on the next one.